going to do a refret today, and the subject is this National Triolian. Isn't this thing a beauty? Just look at all the patina that's developed over decades and decades of play. Just kidding, this thing was actually built in 2012. And no, this isn't a relicking job. This is the effect of a couple thousand gigs, many of them outdoors. Some people play hard, and it shows. It's got a number of bumps and bruises on it, as you might imagine. Probably the worst of which was a seam separation at the back here, over the neck block. This was brazed together again. It was good for a time, and then it reopened, at which point the JB weld was introduced. That seems to have done the trick. Um, sometimes these road repairs add something to the story. Other times they're just there to make it through the show, you know? And it just keeps on holding, so why change it? Frets. These have been dressed at least twice, to my knowledge, and they're getting a bit uneven, and there's some divots forming. Um, they're not super low, in the range of about 30 thousandths. Uh, the player wants them taller. For some reason, when National got going again in the early 2000s, they issued tradition on these models, and they went to the jumbo size. Uh, these are probably around 105 thousandths wide, I imagine. Yeah. Um, the early examples which they are based off of from the 30s, 20s, and 30s, they have fairly small wire by today's standards. A lot of people enjoy the bigger frets. Some people can't get used to them. This player doesn't mind the jumbos. It's what he wants on there. Since I've shown a number of refrets in recent months, we'll just hit the highlights, I think. I'll start by scoring along the sides of the frets to control chip out. This is an ebony board, and it's got a radius on it. Some of the earlier ones from the 2000s had a flat maple board, uh, like that example we saw a couple of weeks ago. I'll heat the fret up. Some of these seem to have been installed with glue, others aren't, but in any case this does help in the removal process. They came out pretty cleanly. Just walk across with my fret pulling pliers here. In general, ebony boards seem to want to hold on to the frets more than rosewood. They're more prone to chip out, but in this case it was fine. Just a couple of tiny little spots. I'll pull down my trusty old leveling beam, which happens to be an actual level in this case. One of these days I might get me one of those purpose-built tools, but this thing has been working fine for years, and I'm kind of loath to change it. I drew some hatch marks on the surface to keep track of what's getting sanded. I used 220 grit, so it takes a little while, but I don't mind. I'd rather sneak up on it than sand too much. And I'm preserving the radius. It's hard to describe how that happens. It's just sort of a light touch and following the curve. Once things are straight from end to end, I will switch over to my 16-inch radius sanding block, and this helps to really keep things true. I'll also sand some fall away into the extension, as this tends to kick up on triolians, especially the 12 fret models like this, where it's screwed down to the body. Here's one of the bigger chips that came out. I'll slip a waxed piece of veneer into the slot, get some thin super glue in there, and some ebony dust pack that in there, tamp it down, and uh, after which I can put some more glue on top, wait for it to cure, and I can scrape and sand it. While that's firming up I'll use this little tool to make sure all the slots are deep enough to accept the tang on the replacement frets. I'll be using Stumac 149 wire, not a sponsor, which is actually about one thousandth of an inch narrower than the original but that's close enough. The fill is hard enough to scrape down with a razor blade and then sand with some 600 and 1200 paper. I'll clean out all the slots using a little hooked knife tool here. I want to get all the way to the ends. Then I'll gently chamfer the top surface of the slot. This helps the new frets go in and it cuts down on damage if they ever have to come out again. Then I'll roll the radius into the wire using a fret bender slightly overbending it. Cut it to size. If there's a little piece left over I always mark it because at some point down the road I'm gonna need it. I'll use tang nippers to get rid of little pieces at the ends so the crown can ride over top of the fingerboard binding. Because the wire is ever so slightly over radiused I have to leave a little gap between the tang and the binding so it has room to press outwards during installation as the fret flattens. 
you don't measure this. This is just something you learn with experience. Some small amount of tang always remains after being clipped away, and if you don't file it off, you can see it at the ends of the frets when you're done. I don't like the way it looks, so I get rid of it. Fret installation, I've shown this a bunch of times. Put a little bit of uh, fish glue in the slot, tap down the ends with a hammer, press it home with the fret press. Clean up any excess, squeeze out, and then work my way down the board. And I check each fret as I go to make sure that it's fully seated against the fingerboard. As I work my way up onto the portion of the board that rides over the body, depending on how snug they are in the slots, I might lightly file the barbs on each side of the tang, just a little bit to make them a little more easy to tap in, because I have to hammer them. And though there is something of a support inside, that sheet metal isn't all that thick. So I really don't want to have to pound on the guitar harder than is necessary to get the frets in. You can also see that I've got a towel resting on top of the resonator area of the body because this is an extremely loud procedure. Um, it just It's a very clangy kind of thing and you'll wake up the neighbor's baby if you're doing it late at night like I'm doing here. The new frets will end up considerably taller, so a new nut will be necessary. I'd already shimmed the old one about three years ago, so it's definitely time. I'm getting this nut set up while the glue has a chance to dry in those fret slots, just trying to keep the work moving along at pace and being efficient. Marking the front surface here. Most of these steps were covered in more detail in a video I put up a couple of weeks ago featuring another triolian. I think I called it National Nut Newness, maybe. Here I'm cutting the blank to shape, using the half pencil to give me a guideline. I'll sand it to shape, leaving just about two millimeters extra. That's close enough that I won't have too much bone to file through when we're doing the slots. Marking the distance from the edge of the fretboard to the outside strings, and then checking to see how that agrees with the old nut. It's pretty close. I'll mark the string to string spacing and then roughly cut the slots to depth. The glue has had enough time to dry so I can nip off the overhanging ends of the frets. I protect the body using a thin piece of sheet metal here that I've wrapped some tape around. Then I'll file the ends flush and also angle them using this uh, file holding device. Homemade, low tech, just a file held at about a 20 degree angle. With marker on the fret tops I can get back to work with the leveler level. This is light work. I've seen people do this for the first time and they really want to grind, but you know, that's just counterproductive. You end up flexing things and it's not flat. It just sort of floats along. They all float, Georgie. I take my online career into my hands anytime I put out a resonator video. Not as many people want to watch them, I guess. The only thing less lucrative are videos including a ukulele. Uh, people will also scroll past banjos too, for some reason. But I won't be swayed. I intend to provide variety. So, knowing that if you're watching this, you're probably an aficionado, we should probably talk about, I don't know, favorite resonator recordings. What's your favorite? I think you really do have to go back in time, because it, it feels to me like it's of an era. Not to say there aren't great resonator players these days, but um, it just it feels antique in a way that some other instruments don't. I love the sound of Tampa Red on that tricone of his. So dexterous. Blind Boy Fuller. Could never play any of that stuff. Um, I love the way Sun House attacks the bass strings. It's like he's pushing the guitar into this sort of dangerous, overdriven territory, even though it's not plugged in. As a repair guy, I have to wonder what the nut and saddle on Sunhouse's guitars look like, because he's pulling that low D out so far. I mean, it's out of the grooves and snapping back into them. It's, 
truly vicious technique. When was the last time you heard a resonator on the radio? I'm talking like the average listener, not the discerning ear. So there's a, quite a bit of slide playing out there, but the distinctive resonator tone, I don't know. Maybe the opening to Lola by the Kinks, that's like 50 years ago. I mean, sure, it lives on in various pockets of roots and blues and Americana music, but it's probably not a familiar sound to a lot of people. For a long time, I thought that one of my all-time favorites, uh, Dark Was the Night, Cold Was the Ground by Blind Willie Johnson, was played on one of these, because it really sounds like it, at least to me. But then I figured out that it was recorded in 1927, and I'm reasonably sure that Willie Johnson did not have the resources to get his hands on one of these things the very first year they were introduced. He did later on, though. By the end of the 30s, he was playing one. You know, these things were the solution to a problem of volume in an era when PA systems weren't sophisticated, and if you wanted to play outdoors, oftentimes you're competing against horns or banjos, a guitar would get lost immediately. Um, this is a speaker cabinet powered by your fingers. You can play on a street corner and you could hear it across the street, which is not something that happens with a simple acoustic from the 1920s, you know. They were smaller, narrower, not really up to the task, so you can tell why people who sang for a living outdoors really wanted one of these. I'm going to set the nut slot heights a thousandth or two above where I normally would because I know how fast this player wears them down. This is Brendan from the Vaudevillian. I've mentioned them before. Interesting thing, as opposed to most resophonic individuals, he likes playing with lighter gauges. This is strung with 11 to 52s and it's still quite powerful. I'll see if I can make a few sounds with this thing. I'm not in good form this week. <laughs> 